Welcome to Atmospheric Tales, a podcast that amplifies stories and experiences related to air pollution and climate change from around the world. I'm your host Shahzad Ghani and welcome to another episode of Atmospheric Tales. Our interviewer for this episode is Dr. Collins Gamelli Hodoli. Collins holds a PhD in Environment and Agri-Food from Cranfield University in the UK, where his research focused on the applicability of low-cost sensors for ground-based air quality monitoring in resource-constrained environments, using Ghana as an exemplar for wider Africa. He is also the founder and director of operations at Clean Air One Atmosphere, a registered not-for-profit in Ghana that is using DIY approaches and low-cost environmental sensing tools to revolutionize air quality monitoring in Ghana and across Africa. Our guest today is a chemical engineer, educator and an entrepreneur with 16 years of experience in manufacturing, hazardous chemicals and waste, climate change, mobility and air pollution. Her research seeks to support evidence-based air quality management policy by assessing the impact of transport emissions on human health and the environment with a focus on African cities. She holds a PhD from University of York in the UK in environmental science and currently supervises and teaches at the School of Engineering and Technology at the Southeastern Kenya University in Kenya. In addition, she is a member of several associations working to foster collaboration between African air pollution scientists, local and international communities, and policymakers such as Kenya Air Quality Network, which she is a founding member of. She is also a co-founder of AfriSTEM Connection, a company working to increase STEM awareness in underserved communities in Africa. I am excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Andriana Mbandi. Welcome to the show, Collins and Andriana. Thank you very much, Shazad. And welcome once again, Dr. Andriana, to the show. We appreciate your presence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Collins and Shazad. And I'm looking forward to this conversation we'll have on air pollution in Africa. Thank you. So, Dr. Andrena, we're just going to take it straight away. There's a recent report by UNICEF that claimed that air pollution in Africa has increased dramatically, and deaths from outdoor air pollution have increased by nearly 60% in less than three decades. Can you start by telling us what are the major sources of air pollution in African metropolis with a focus on Nairobi? Thank you very much, Colin. So it's interesting that it's been identified very specifically that air pollution is increasing in a number of years. This is interesting for me because a few years ago when I got interested to start looking at air pollution while working in South Africa, I got told a lot that air pollution is not a challenge in Africa. But it's good to see such reports are actually quantifying this and giving an upwards uh, trend. And if you start looking at Nairobi, for example, as a city in Africa, together with a lot of other sub-Saharan African cities, some of the major sources of air pollution are, for example, look at our transport uh, sector. Sectors. And I would say even in our metropolis, another source would be waste. Only way of waste management for a lot of cities is to openly ban the waste in big waste dumps. Another source, of course, is our industries that are placed in close proximity to, to residential areas and also poorly controlled. I think another source of air pollution that is often not looked at is dust. We suspended dust from our unpaved roads in our cities as well as construction sites. Some of this is open quarries that are also having operations that are very heavily polluting. But of course, the traditional sources such as agriculture and use of biomass should not be underestimated as contributor to pollution in an urban areas in Africa. These are typical sources in a lot of other African cities. Thanks a lot for your submission. With respect to data on air pollution, it shows that the poorest populations suffer the most serious consequences of depreciation in air quality. Why is this phenomenon so marked in the countries of the African continent? And how is environmental vulnerability linked to structural social inequality in these countries? Thank you, Collins. It's good we addressed this and from the onset, just to say that environment injustice is something that is quite particular in the African continent. And just speaking from our communities in Kenya, for example, when you look at our cities, how they were planned and for who they were planned for, our cities are planned for a population which has since then exploded in terms of the numbers because of rural to urban migration. And you find that this planning that has been done back in the 60s before pre-independence, really, you find it was poorly planned in an inclusive way. You find most poor communities living close proximity to heavily polluting sources. And we're not just talking about air pollution. We are talking about any kind of environment pollution. We think of the, these communities as well as having poor access to amenities such as hospitals. They don't have access to water, to electricity, to sanitation. 
Again, their houses, the way the houses are constructed because of lack of resources, but also part of the poor planning is you find that their housing is crowded, this really poor ventilation in terms of even thinking of air pollution and emissions. Energy is expensive in Africa. You find that they are mostly don't have access to clean energy. They have access to biomass or any other kind of fossil fuels that are of poor quality. So, you know, they have the aspect of indoor air pollution. These communities have a triple threat where air pollution is concerned. So they have pollution at home in their houses, indoors, as they're cooking, they're lighting, they're heating, they're using poor, unclean energy, and so they're already having pollution exposure at home. Then as they go to work, then they work in these uh, industries in close proximity to their areas that are poorly regulated, heavily polluting. So at work, they also have occupational exposure to air pollution. Then on the way to work or to school, in the case of children, their houses are close to roadsides, they're walking by the roadside. So again, they're exposed as they're accessing their schools, their places of work. So that's a triple threat. And if you look at it this way, then it is sensible that these communities would have some of the highest exposure to high levels of air pollution, but will have the poorest access to any of the infrastructure that is in place, perhaps to treat when you have morbidities or you have diseases from these exposures. You'll also have loss of productivity. So in a way, when you look at air pollution or any environment pollution, we have to consider that our poorest communities have a heavier burden. And when you look at Africa, those are a big part, a majority of our communities, really. Some of the meetings we've been having with the policymakers and in some of these communities, actually utilizing a lot of citizen science where communities are involved in the co-development and co-production and implementation of some of these air pollution projects that identify interventions has been the key role of planners in some of these interventions. A lot of our cities, referring back to the 60s, when they were planted, they had identified industrial areas as specific areas of use that identified residential areas, commercial areas, and within those residential areas, they had schools, hospitals, etc. But what happened is that in the end, the cities had mixed use. So areas that are originally identified for industrial, people moved closer to get closer to work and therefore residential areas sprang up. But what we do in this case where these areas were sort of locked already into those land use patterns, can we change it? And if we do, can we create perhaps barriers that enable communities not to be exposed to such levels of pollution? For example, planting trees, green barriers to pollution, for example. These are these things that cannot be handled alone by only by atmospheric scientists, for example. These are fine solutions through bringing together different communities of the environment, of planning, of engineering. But it's a big challenge. I think it's, it's something that we can say it's common for a lot of uh, you know, African cities. Great. Thanks a lot, Dr. Andreana. We're going to move a little bit into transportation, air pollution, and climate change policies. Your research has focused on the impacts of transport emissions on human health and environment. The critical thing you look at was in African cities. So tell us, why should we be concerned about road transport emissions? I think we can agree that we live in a continent. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has very low levels of access to sustainable mobility by any definition access to transport is still an issue for a lot of the sub-Saharan Africa. But even then, in our cities, the opposite of that is in our cities, we have uh, very high motorization rates for many different reasons. The internal combustion engine, it's not a very efficient system. So that means even as you are using diesel or petrol, you will always have uh, vehicle exhaust emissions coming from the exhaust of the vehicle. That means you will have volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, black carbon, a lot of uh, different pollutants from that process of internal combustion engine. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of the vehicles that end up in Africa are secondhand vehicles. A lot of the times these vehicles imported are old, poorly maintained, not with any technologies. And to add to that, our fuels that fuel these cars are not always clean. Furthermore, if you look at our roads, I don't know about for you in Accra, but in Nairobi, our roads are also not so good. They have a lot of potholes, a lot of dust, but even then we still don't have enough roads, hence problem of congestion. So if you look at that dynamic for air pollution, for transport emissions, then you start to understand some of these emissions we are exposed to and then this increased mortalities in our populations as well as mobilities. About Accra, it's a similar thing. I think it's just the characteristics of Africa. Most of the vehicles that is used in Ghana as well, they are imported and uh, most of the cars on the roads don't have even catalytic converters working. We like to talk about technology transfer, leapfrogging, but it's technology dumping, which happens a lot with Africa, which means that as we are importing our vehicles, the vehicles we are getting are the ones with the poorest technologies. Sometimes they even remove some of these technologies from the vehicles, like you're talking about catalytic converters. And even if the vehicles get here intact, sometimes our mechanics on the first instance, when they have a challenge with the vehicle, they will remove them because there's no way to do the repair and maintenance in a sustainable way. 
Now, the other bit is this. What is the relationship between emissions and public health? From the exhaust of the vehicle and even from the tires of the car, you get very fine particles produced. Now, when you breathe in these particles, they actually cause a different host of diseases from having breathed and having been in contact with your body. And by the way, Collins, when you look at the impact on health, we normally talk about what we actually are used to, lung cancer, a stroke, and other respiratory illnesses. But actually, recent studies have shown that even at uh, preterm, before the child is born, you are already impacted. So I always say to people that air pollution, even from the transport sector, affects the human organs from the head to the toe, and it even affects us even before we are born. Thank you very much. And just a bit on that, I read an article that says that you know exposure to air pollution at childhood could actually contribute to mental health issues in adulthood. So it's critical that you brought that up and uh, we look at how we're able to navigate. I'm going to push this down a little bit on local air quality. What is local air quality like in Nairobi, Kenya, in terms of transport? And when we talk about emissions from transport, how does it affect local air quality? Air pollution in Nairobi is one that we can stitch up from different studies or at least different measurement campaigns, both on the ground and from satellite. But similar to a lot of African cities, we have a very poor understanding what air pollution levels they are. I'll give you an example. Some of the cities I work in Africa, in Southern Africa, have 17 monitoring stations in a city of three or four million people. Nairobi, as we speak now, I have knowledge of at least two monitoring stations, one at a local university and one at a research station. Now, Nairobi is a city of close to 5 million people of just the county itself. If you look at the metropolitan, that is much bigger population. Considering that, that means what we do know is alarming. We need to know more, but while we are finding out more, we still need to act on reducing the pollution levels because any study that has been done since 2000 shows the air pollution levels are anything from three to 20 times higher than WHO guidelines, for example, for the fine particulate matter. You said that while we find in more, we should be taking actions as well. Do you think the action is not really happening? That's an interesting thing to think about because as scientists, we often work on scientific problems, obviously, but a lot of the work for interventions gets done at policy and implementation level. A lot of the discourse around air pollution for our cities has been that we do not really have regulations or limits that can be used policy-wise to take action on air pollution. But if you do an assessment, you realize there is regulation. But the question for Africa is always, I guess, in my experience, has been the implementation. How do you make active interventions to reduce air pollution? If I look at the transport sector specifically, and I take an example from Europe, for example, we are acting in petrol vehicles in terms of the climate change policy. It seems a very wise course of action because those contribute to higher levels of greenhouse gases compared to diesel vehicles. So there was a policy normalization of dieselization of fleets, which means they wanted to have more diesel vehicles because those would reduce the greenhouse gases. But what happened? At that time, when they were taking up action on climate policy, they ignored the health policy, which should take into consideration that air pollution impacts public health. So at one point, they realized having a lot of diesel in their fleets is still also impacting on public health. So some of the times, some policies can counteract others. Sometimes policies can be poorly implemented or not at all. And sometimes it can just be a fail to integrate some of the actions that are taking place in our cities. For example, investment in mass rapid transit, which means instead of just all of us being in our private cars in our cities, having increased motorization rates, we can use public transport that is well invested. But you know what happens with our public transport. Our public transport is poorly invested, which means as soon as anyone has any bit of money, they will buy a car, which they'll be using as a private car. And it might be the same as Nairobi, where you end up being in traffic jam for three, four hours, breathing in the vehicle fumes, spending a lot on fuel and not using the public transport. But I can understand why people don't want to as well. Exactly. And there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to that. It's a similar situation in Accra as well. And so you think about the roadside with vendors, sellers and all of them, and then people who have been selling traffic, how much pollution they are exposed to. When you talk about transport and mobility, all of that, looking at the UK, for instance, the government have initiated some policies to reduce emissions from transportation. For instance, there are areas that are demarcated low emission zones and others ultra emission zones. So for you to be able to use these areas, your vehicle should meet a specific standard. Do you think or do you foresee these happening in any major city in Africa soon? 
Recently, we had a meeting where some African countries attended and they were giving the different initiatives that they have undertaken in terms of reducing air pollution or ensuring better air quality for their countries and cities. And I learned of a recent initiative from Rwanda in Kigali where they have assigned low emission zones. But uh, more than Kigali, I want to refer to different African cities where they have had initiatives such as car-free days. In mind, I have Kigali, I have Addis Ababa. And in addition to just having car-free days, they have an increasing greening initiative in the city where they're encouraging people to walk and cycle, take back the city in a way from dominated by roads and vehicles, investing in infrastructure to allow people to walk and cycle, to green their cities so there's better parks and access for people to, to interact really just beyond having roads and vehicles moving, taking us from place to place. So having knowledge of this too and knowing that Nairobi tried a car-free day previously and that was not successful, so the question is why? But as well as even I look at Nairobi, I know that there's been investment in a project where it looked at a downtown street in Luthuli Avenue, for example, in Nairobi, where they expanded the pedestrian use and encouraged more use by pedestrians and cyclists and to ease congestion in the city as well. So various initiatives, but not to the extent that you have in the UK. To even get to the UK, it would need, of course, policy and investment, real investment and resources. Some of these cities have policies. But more than that, I always say to champion what the cities are already doing. So these cities have car-free days. They have encouraged uh, mobility and movement. And during those car-free days, the pollution levels have reduced. Has it been uh, trumpeted? Has it created awareness? Where can they go from this? They get public buy-in. So in such a case, we haven't gotten to know emission zones, but to get there, I think we have building blocks to move towards that. So I think uh, we can only move to a more sustainable way of looking at transportation instead of just looking at very car-centric cities. I would argue this is what our cities were planned for back in the 60s. But now we are in the year 2021. It is time to embrace some of these aspects that ensure a more healthier, more inclusive society within our cities. Do you think public knowledge on the subject has a role to play? Plus, when you're talking about air pollution and people need to eat, they have to feed their families, they have to take care of their families, their wars, and they have to put their vehicles on the road. Don't you think it is a bit very complex? Yes, actually, Collins, it is. You know, it also speaks to the reason why when you start to understand about environment and the environment sector in general, not just air pollution, any other kind of environment, pollution, climate change, any considerations for the environment, it's always put forward that acting on air pollution, for example, as part of acting against environment pollution, that it puts us in contrast with providing jobs and development. For that matter, roads, infrastructure, cars, access to transport, like we spoke about before. But I put it to you, really, Collins, in exploring the history of actions on clean air, I've not found one instance globally, really, not just in Africa, that a country has had to not develop so that they can get cleaner air. In fact, what has happened is that as they developed, their air got cleaner because they took actions and some of these actions are also coinciding with our development. But I also put it to you, you cannot continue to provide jobs for people while killing them. So I'll put it to you this way. You cannot continue to say that you're providing jobs in a factory that is polluting, for example, on the roadside where most of our youth, women, children spend in doing business and you're providing all that. But then at the same time you're spending a lot, a lot more, three to four percent of your GDP on public health. You're spending a lot more on days lost for productivity, children not getting to school. You cannot make an argument for development that way. But the good news is that nobody globally has had to do that. They have all developed at the same time as cleaning the environment. So a case can be made for both. Thanks a lot, Dr. Andriana. That's great. We're moving to air pollution measurement capacity in Kenya and other African countries. So what is the level of development of air quality monitoring networks in Kenya? I think you did touch a bit earlier on these, uh, comparing what is in Nairobi to what is in South Africa. But if you could hit on these again and provide sort of an outlook for other African cities. So when I started to do my PhD, I remember looking at maps. You attend a lot of conferences, and these conferences normally present maps of Africa for different reasons. Periodic mapping of different things. It could be a reduction of poverty, sanitation access, etc. And it always disturbed me that when you showed the map of Africa, it would just show one blank canvas. There will be no hotspots, there will be nothing on it. And I thought maybe just intellectual laziness. Did you really take a look and do beyond that the superficial first glance of doing a review? Did you go beyond that? But unfortunately for ground air quality monitoring, I would say that it does look very sparse. And I'm speaking specifically to ground monitoring. So a lot of what goes on in air quality monitoring is mostly short term. It's really sparse. It's really periodic. 
means, you know, they just measure for a short time. And I would say it's mostly piecemeal for a lot of our cities, but also you hear I said cities. It means it's very city centric. Our interest for air pollution cannot only be focused in cities. We need to have an understanding of what's happening also in the rural areas, what's happening in the cleaner areas in comparison to the dirtier or more polluted areas. A lot of our air quality monitoring is not undertaken by researchers on the continent. There's a tendency for people to come and monitor for a period of their projects, uh, present that data. A lot of that information doesn't go towards informing policy or even implementation. It is for, it seems to be an academic exercise. So in that way, I think we are in dire straits given the importance of clean air for all. Somewhere there's a big gap and it's a gap that needs to be filled and urgently. Thanks a lot for the submission. Don't you think with respect to not having continuous monitoring or having locals to be able to take ownership of even these periodic projects also has a role to play? Because if someone is just putting something across, a sensor or an instrument to monitor for a specific period of time, just for research, for instance, my research, I was just put there for one year or something. And once the research is done, I'm not going to continue to use that for anything else. Don't you think that if we are able to develop interest and be able to take ownership of this project as locals, we will be having some form of information on the ground and as a benchmark for future ways and even to expand? Yes, actually, there's a role for research and I cannot uh, speak more strongly about research. Absolutely. But research is just the one arm to air quality management research and development. There's another arm for legislative framework that allows for policies, implementation, interventions, setting standards, checking against those standards if you've met those standards, and going through the cycle of air quality management. So research has a role, and indeed, the efforts that are there actually inform us on what levels of there was, because without those, we would not have that. However, there is something to be said about investment in the infrastructure that is needed for air quality management beyond research. As I've stated, there's many different arms to air quality management. But the other thing that you've mentioned that interests me, of course, as a researcher, is the use of new technologies and research and development's role in air quality management. So new technologies have a big role to play in increasing networks and getting data for and filling in that gap that we have in Africa. And I always speak very strongly for leapfrogging, which means there's low cost tensors available in a way that they weren't available before for air quality monitoring. And looking at just ground monitoring, increasing the coverage on the ground, but also looking at using other technologies such as satellite data, if it's available, to layer and add spatial and temporal coverage for air quality. And I cannot state strongly enough for that, but there is a role for African governments as they have the mandate of ensuring a clean environment for their citizens, including clean air. And as enforcement and compliance agencies, it means that they have a role to play in ensuring that there is no contravention of the different standards and limits for air pollution levels. So you can see that all this for me always works together in ensuring that we have access to this clean air and keep our air clean. You did mention about local capacity building. So when it comes to the local census or the utility of local census, are we also looking at capacity building in data creation? Because it is already established in terms of data from that. But there is these impacts of atmospheric variables on the data from these instruments. We're we looking to correct the data as well, or we're we just looking to, for instance, as you said earlier, in the current stage, we can use some of them to actually understand hotspots. What exactly when it comes to the local capacity building in terms of using these local sensors or new technologies, what exactly are you referring to? Absolutely. I think what happened initially when use of local sensors first emerged in different parts of the world and how they were being used, I think the conversation sort of took some time before it became more prominent in Africa. And at the time, I remember governments were coming forward, for example, or different key stakeholders were coming forward and say, what about local sensors? What is the utility for local sensors? Can we use them in place of reference instrumentation that is mandated through their standards and their legislations? And I think we and I said this as a we, as a research community, I think we did that. And what happened in the absence of that, the people in the manufacturing world sort of took leadership. And I've come across a lot of different countries using these local sensors in many different ways, but without guidelines in which way you can use them. As you've mentioned, Colin, this different utility for local sensors, for hotspotting, trying to find out trends, increasing coverage in where we have sparse networks, in place where they are co-located with reference instrumentation. And as you've correctly pointed out, they're corrected for different 
different weather parameters, yeah, environmental parameters such as humidity, temperature, then there's definitely utility for them. But in the absence of such advice or a template for use for governments or different authorities, what has happened is that they have somehow entered the market as reference instrumentation. And you can see where the challenge would be. So for me, I would always advocate as a scientist for a hybrid system where the, some of these technologies complement each other for different utilities. And you should be upfront as scientists to feed to that policy process so that these city authorities with their sparse resources understand how the utility of these sensors in addition to other technologies which may emerge even in the future. Actually, I'm involved in a project currently with uh, different African cities where we are deploying local sensors. And we are doing so in conjunction with the different city authorities in these countries. And the reason we are doing this is because we recognized early on that city uh, governments and authorities need support in capacity building, in understanding these new technologies and how they can be used. Some of the cities that are taken on as pilot cities have deployed the sensors and have also looked at uh, using satellite data to have an initial rapid assessment to understand what are the levels of air pollution, but also the hotspots to understand where they are going to be deploying these stations, given our limited resources, where are the best place to deploy this. And those cities are disabled it's in Nairobi, uh, Gaberone, Cape Town. And you can see the capacity for those cities are at different levels, but they have all expressed interest in using these new technologies such as sensors, satellite data to fulfill their different mandates in air quality management. So for me as a scientist, it's a technology that can be used to fill in the gap for the air quality data that we really don't have for Africa and can be used also to inform policies that go towards reducing air pollution levels and ensuring that we are not impacting on public health and our environment. That's very insightful. Thanks a lot. In your commentary in the Clean Air Journal, titled Pollution in Africa in the Time of COVID-19, The Air We Breathe, Indoors and Outdoors, you put these across. Globally, outdoor air pollution has declined in 27 countries in the first two weeks of lockdown. This decline has been attributed to lower emissions from transport and industry-related activities. Scientists have cautioned for these studies to be interpreted against seasonal meteorological variation. However, these analyses are often not possible in Africa, where the limited ground air quality monitoring is often sparse, short-term, piecemeal, and where most of these campaigns are to test new technologies and not often targeted towards the local problems, but rather the external project priorities. Can you expand on these, lay emphasis on collaborations and also look at what sort of synergies we need to develop and what is the way forward? For me, I remember when I was writing that commentary, I remember feeling an element of frustration. But isn't that the bedrock of good research? If you're not in a comfortable place, you cannot do good research, I would argue. But I remember seeing a lot of satellite data for cities having lower levels of pollution, specifically fine particulate matter nitrogen dioxide as well. And I remember thinking, okay, blue skies was something that people are noticing for the first time. And I remember thinking, this is in the midst of this pandemic, which we continue to be in, which has been devastating. There's maybe a silver lining. And in fact, that's how the stories were framed last year, February, March, that people are seeing clean skies for the first time in a lot of cities around the world. I remember thinking, as any other African scientist, what about Africa? What about my city? What's happening? And I remember searching for information and finding that information. That information would be available if you looked at satellite data instead of just looking at ground monitoring. But that information still needs ground monitoring in terms of validation, especially in a continent that is not as well monitored. So this is where writing that commentary came from. But I also remember feeling shocked that when we are talking about COVID recovery packages for our communities, we're not considering clean energy. We, in fact, were increasing taxes for things like LPG, which is used a lot for cooking. So we are giving these communities food aid and other aid which is needed. At the same time, we are telling them to spend more money where they will use dirtier fuels, they'll breathe air that is not clean, that will increase their levels of mortalities in general. So it seems like a contrast for me. You asked an important question where given these inequalities, but also given that Africa is awash with donors. I don't know about other continents, but this is the way I feel about Africa and they're doing good work. But there seems to be a limited appetite for actual local partnership. And this is just from my experience. And this actually translates to research too. But African governments at the same time have pledged a proportion of their budget. In Kenya, we've pledged, I think, 2% research and development. 
But how does that translate to the ground to someone like you and me doing research on air pollution? Do you have knowledge of how you access these funds? Are they accessible to researchers as grants? Because we cannot continue to expect that the African research agenda for even air pollution, which is funded externally, that will have an African agenda. That is not sensible at all. A very good professor, a good friend of mine and a mentor said to me, at the time when I was experiencing real frustration at access to some of this funding that is not accessible to us as African researchers. And when it does, it has to be a partnership and it's a partnership. We don't have access to these resources. Mm -hmm. It's preferentially given to Northern researchers, for example, to do work in Africa. He said to me, but where is your funding from your government? Their government's funding their researchers. Where is your funding from the Kenyan government? Where is your funding from the Ghanaian government? Just stepping away a little bit from air pollution, looking at COVID vaccines, manufacturing capacity in Africa, research and development into this pandemic. If we are not investing in our researchers on the continent, how can we expect that we have answers to some of these very important questions? Most structural vulnerabilities such as lack of housing, public health, lack of sanitation, and water supply hunger et al. are visible because we can see the immediate impact. Now with air pollution, in most cases, it is invisible. We don't get to see, like somebody can be knocked on the road, you get to see that. But with air pollution, we don't see that. In addition to causing less immediate effect and sometimes cumulative for years, how do you think it is possible to raise awareness about the adverse effects of poor air quality especially on vulnerable populations in low and middle income countries? Where we start actually is to find an easy, available entry point to raise awareness. I'll give you an example. Africa is awash with clean cook stoves. I don't know about you in Accra, in Ghana, but I think my mother has at least three or four at any given time. She has different stoves that are brought in by different development partners or donors to communities in rural areas to enable clean cooking, which is a challenge in Africa where more than 80% of the population does not have access to what is defined as clean cooking. So an entry point for me would be that already very well established infrastructure for clean cooking and clean energy in Africa to also have a conversation about air pollution. You'll be surprised that this is not normally addressed in these clean cooking initiatives in Africa. They'll talk about climate change. They'll talk about deforestation. And these are real and very important issues for Africa. But at the same time, you're talking about climate strategy for cooking. You should also be talking about air pollution. Because for me, that's an easy, available entry point for infrastructure that already exists to create awareness on air pollution. It doesn't take away. In fact, it strengthens those initiatives. So core benefit is a thing that should be included in a lot of projects, a lot of initiatives in Africa. So it's not just the easy entry points, it's creating awareness from something these different communities already understand, but also working with local communities in a real way. I think we are rather fond of working with communities, co-development, co-implementation, but the actual practice of it really uh, means that you need to have long-term strategy and implementation of this kind of initiatives rather than the short-term projects you normally have. That way, you're increasing awareness and taking the populations with you instead of just having an instance of interaction and hoping that that will actually affect behavior change. You are the co-founder of Afristam. You also work with other organizations on improving the participation of underrepresented communities in STEM in order to increase access to quality education, improve livelihoods, sustain economic growth, participate in industry innovation and infrastructure, and be part of environmentally aware and also sustainable communities in Africa. Can you talk a little bit about your own journey, why you care about capacity building and your work towards it? Uh, sure, yes. I think a lot of us are not fortunate to find what I consider hat in the work that we do. And a lot of us are fortunate too, and I think that happened for me. At heart, I'm an engineer. I like finding solutions. But more importantly, I like training, I like education, I like to get involved with different communities. And I remember a few years ago, I was at yet another high-level meeting. And it was two days of different meetings and consultation process. And I remember thinking in the second day, I didn't really have knowledge of what exactly these different projects entailed. There was a disconnect, the static nature of our syllabuses in school. If you have a syllabus in engineering at university in Kenya or in, I imagine, in Ghana, that syllabus has looked the same since the 1960s. It's not changed to reflect the changing nature of our societies and our communities and our needs and challenges, exactly. 
Yet we continue to talk about the lack of STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We keep talking about the lack of capacity. We keep talking about our children not going to school to do STEM. We keep talking about our factories and manufacturing not having capacity because we don't have technicians, artists, and engineers. But at the heart of it, I asked, what is it that we're doing exactly to bridge this gap? A lot has been done and credit to the different initiatives on the continent to bridge that gap. But I felt that still there was a gap where underserved communities who are often, I don't know about for you in West Africa, but they're often at the very rich, resource rich part of the continent is also the underserved communities, is also the vulnerable communities. How can we bridge that disconnect? Because on one hand, these communities are sitting on very rich resources, a lot of different resources, but yet they don't have any way to access them. They definitely don't benefit them. So why not find a way to grow a community of technologists, engineers, artisans from these communities, but at the same time, ensuring they have STEM capacity also to be environmentally aware, to create sustainable solutions for Africa, for Africa's challenges. So that's how AfriSTEM came about. My co-founder is Josephine. She's an embedded systems engineer. So she works on different ICT technologies and she likes to look at the different ways that you can use those technologies. And so together we started AfriSTEM and we've had some measure of success in, you know, starting outreach to schools. And we started doing the outreach, actually looking at air pollution. So looking at the back end of sensors, how can our school going children in this underserved community start to understand the back end of sensors? How they are they created? How are they built? And how do they actually measure these environment parameters? So Collins, at the end of the day, I would like to have a road engineer that is working, that is building roads and bridges, but in a sustainable way and not cutting trees to build these roads. They can see a solution that will keep the trees, but as well as build the roads that we need. Can you imagine having a chemical engineer that is working in Ghana in your gold mining process, and instead of using harmful chemicals, they can find a sustainable way to have this very high efficient process to produce the gold, but still not harm the environment. What about a structural engineer? She, she would be building some of these infrastructures using locally sourced materials from her community that is adding value to these resources in Africa. So that's my vision. Uh, we are just starting. We have a lot of partnerships so far that is allowing some of the work that we have embarked on. In all these things that we've discussed or you've addressed, don't you think that we need an integrated policy approach? And when it comes to Africa, all these things we have learned from these parts of the world, how can we, because we are now emerging with all of those, how can we take advantage of that so we don't go through the same lessons? This is a very good argument to me. And, you know, not only do I make that argument, I practice it. That means as much as it is possible, because even for us researchers, engineers, we also have our limitations on integrating. But as far as it is possible, you can integrate different policies for climate change, public health, energy, mining, and I'm always advocating for championing what you're doing already. So if it is clean energy, you're possibly already touching on public health, you're already touching on ecosystems, you're already touching on development, poverty reduction, you're touching on so many different aspects and so many different policies. So why not champion it? At the same time, it buys us the goodwill that we need for this to continue, but also it ensures that we are not implementing policies that are undoing the good that others are done. So with the limited resources we have, having an integrated way of looking at some of these challenges is ensuring that we can actually move those mega resources that we have that much further for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrea. I really appreciate your time and the great and insightful missions you've made. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Collins. I think even in your different questions and our discussions, you've given me a lot to think about. And I'm looking forward to collaborating uh, with you and other scientists on the continent to ensure that we can all have access to clean air. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Andriana Mbandi, and our interviewer, Dr. Collins Gameli Hodoli, for joining us on this episode of Atmospheric Tales. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and share.